I welcome everybody to the museum's fourth biodiversity seminar for 2021. Um, we hold this seminar series as a way to promote biodiversity education and conservation. Our speaker today is our very own director, Dr. Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez. JC is a, the museum's curator for birds, and he is currently Professor 11 of Zoology at the Annual Biology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences here in UPLB. He obtained his uh, doctorate, his DPhil in zoology at Edward Gray Institute for Field Ornithology and St. Anne's College, University of Oxford in 2012 through the support of the Ford Foundation International Fellowship Program. JC's research interests include the following, ornithology, wildlife biology, conservation biology, vertebrate systematics and phylogeography, tropi tropical evolutionary bioecology and ethnoornithology. Okay. Everybody, let's all give a big warm virtual welcome to our very own director, Dr. Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez. Sir? Thank you, Floor. At, um, good morning, everyone. Maganda umaga po sa inyo lahat. Maayong aga po sa mga, na, uh, mga tiga Siargao. Uh, Notice ko po, andito po, uh, let's acknowledge the presence of Mayor Proserfina Coro and Vice Mayor Alfredo Coro po. Thank you for, for attending po this um, webinar. And also for the other stakeholders, pakibig ko po napansin, um, from, uh, of course, the, uh, from Siargao and, of course, Rigao del Norte. Um, uh, to start with, I'll just share my screen so I can, you can see the title. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, let's put the end ball. So, yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, mangrove associated birds of Shargao. So, it's actually a, a sort of an excerpt of what we did in, uh, in Shargao uh, roughly two years ago. Two years now, not counting the pandemic. Um, so it was fun because it's a very collaborative project. And uh, of course, uh, the museum, including Floor, uh, was had the opportunity to be part of that project. So it is a, um, in, in, our, in our part, being a part of the terrestrial fauna and, of course, working with birds as the, as the consultant for birds. Um, we did the abifauna of coastal forests and mangroves in Del Carmen, Shargao Island, Shargao del Norte, Philippines. Of course, it was part of a bigger project, uh, which was funded through NRC, or the National Research Council of the Philippines, of DOST. It is an assessment and inventory and biological field surveys of flora and fauna of the mangrove forests of Del Carmen, Shargao Island. And it was, of course, led by the University of Santo Tomas, but it was through these uh, uh, very comprehensive set of people working from different taxonomic fields from, of course, the University of the Philippines of um, um, University of the Philippines of Manila, uh, National Museum, um, and several other partners. Uh, I'll show you later. Of course, um, so it's all aspects of both terrestrial and green uh, fauna and flora. So of course, we did the birds. Um, we think it was important because uh, birds are an important model for a lot of ecosystems. It is always recognized as an important bio indicator for environmental health. Uh, bird abundance or often used in your diversity indices are kind of a staple for a lot of uh, uh, monitoring um, systems, especially if you monitor impacts. So if you notice uh, a lot of different um, manuals would include um, uh, BSD we call bird species diversity or bird species richness and abundance as a staple in, in biodiversity monitoring systems. Of course, it often equates with uh, that relationship between birds and their habitat, uh, especially with the plants. Uh, plants directly because they're a source of food, being frugivores, nectivores, carnivores, indirectly because they eat on the insects that feed on the plants. But of course, being carnivores or raptors or uh, that feed on um, other uh, vertebrates. So in some ways, there's always that connection between uh, the extant and birds. And some of our 
take more specialized approaches. So we preferences in for habitat. And of course that drives birds to become more closely associated with the, a particular ecosystem, especially if it's more distinct. There's a lot of differences between those ecosystems, just between forests, may among layers in the canopy, or uh, in a mountain, there's different elevations like most forests. So there, some birds will become more specialized. And of course that leads to coevolution or coadaptation they become more restricted to that particular habitat. It also happens with wetlands. Um, there's a sense that even though it's a bit more monotonous in some ways, uh, there is some what we call the habitat heterogeneity of hypothesis, which was studied by MacArthur and MacArthur, which kind of allows it to provide more um, opportunities and connections. So the, the niches allows more diversity, even uh, in a very uh, unique uh, ecosystem. So birds and mangroves always come hand in hand. It's a bit funny because every time I think about birds and mangroves, I have a lot of students who did studies with this. I just remember this one friend who said, so mangroves. So I was like, ah, oh, yeah. So it's always got stuck in my head now. Every time I talk about birds and mangroves, na alala ko yung friend ko na nagsalita ng wala namang ibon sa mangroves. And I can still hear his, his voice now. Um, so here is just a set of papers that, um, kind of show the importance of mangroves across different tropical areas, which of course harbor mangroves. Um, here's um, a paper from India. Um, it's about 36 species of birds you were able to find. Of course, there's kind of a certain set of groups um, you'll find between all these uh, other papers. So from herons, egrets, plovers, gulls. And you notice there's some unique species, um, uh, interesting species like hawks, kites, sort of, maybe among raptors. And then you have the frugivores like hornbills and more specialized. Uh, wetland species like kingfishers. So here on the opposite side of the world, you have Mexico with 53 species. Again, set of herons, egrets, sandpipers, terns, and you have warblers and kingbirds, or insectivores and frugivores, like parrots. So there's a training manual in there that kind of puts them all together and notices that a lot of these different species of birds actually follow kind of a pattern. So herons, egrets, bitterns, or like waders and sandpipers, Plovers and snipes are shorebirds because of that intermediate be between them, um, um, terrestrial and marine, because you have sometimes like, there's exposed mud flats. So it increases that ability for those species to use that uh, particular habitat. Then you have kingfishers. Although not all kingfishers eat fish, some of them also eat arthropods and for small vertebrates. Then you have the frugivores, pigeons, parakeets, and orioles. Uh, there is some mangrove associates that allow fruit to be available. And of course, some vines, which provide those fruit. And of course, the insectivores, the whistlers, the swiftlets, uh, the woodpeckers, the drongos. And then you have the predators, the sparrowhawks, the sea eagles, and the serpent eagles. So there's always that sort of grouping with uh, their feeding guilds or foraging adaptations. So here's two papers, one in Brazil and one in Australia, um, 81 species in Brazil. Um, there's just a, a bit of, um, increase in the number of species, depending on the biogeographic area, also there's kind of differences in terms of how the habitat intersperses with another. So there are areas that were closer to the mainland, so they have um, uh, connectivity uh, towards uh, the, the landward side and increases diversity because you have that connectivity. You also have the abundance of migratory waders at seasonal uh, times. Um, here you have, uh, fruit seed and insect eaters, and of course, mangroves also provide a sanctuary for threatened birds. Um, then you have the issue of what we call avian mangrove dependent species. So there's, and people kind of put different names to mangrove associated, so mangrove dependent, mangrove associated. Um, so there's a richness of species that tend to be um, restricted to a particular habit, such as mangroves. That some of the species tend to be commuter species. So they don't actually are obligate species to the mangroves. They just use the mangroves as sort of a staging area, especially for a lot of migratory water birds. Um, there is kind of a, um, a pattern between the feeding gills. There's a lot of fruit eaters and insect eaters, as well as nectar feeders. So just another two uh, papers, uh, again from um, Australia and another from Guyana. 
There's 47 species in Cairns. Uh, they looked about nine feeding guilds. And again, they discussed about which species are obligate species to mangroves. They're more restricted to or suited to that particular mangrove habitat. Some are, are not as restricted to, so they have options to go between mangroves and other habitats uh, as our adjacent habitat. So they become facultative. Um, again, different from all those commuter species, which just passes through. Here they had, they found a lot more insectivores that are foliage gleaners. Get a lot of insects move around in the foliage of mangroves and of course, nectivores. Here, the, the dominant species was a garygone. A garygone is kind of a, a small warbler that um, it's a very distinct foliage cleaner. Actually, you'll probably recognize the garygone if you go into the mangrove. Uh, here in the Philippines, we have the yellow belly garygone, um, or sometimes called the fly eater. And they have the very distinctive color. Lagi mo siya every time you go to a mangrove. Um, they also, uh, uh, mangroves are used by waterfowl as important roosting and staging areas for resting areas. Of course, it, we recognize the importance of uh, looking into disturbance or anthropogenic disturbance that affect birds. And of course, coming home, we have two papers in Southeast Asia, one in the Philippines and in Palawan and the other one in Malaysia. So for, here they discussed about the importance of uh, mangrove associated species they actually look more on not just birds but all four uh, vertebrate groups. Um, they think about the importance of using mangroves as a sanctuary to protect uh, threatened species. Uh, of course, 40% of those particular mangrove restricted species are at risk. Here they found about 63 species in Palawan associated with mangroves. Um, it is utilized as a primary habitat for uh, so foraging, nesting, and a staging area for mi migratory species. This is, I think this is the highest in terms of number of species. This is a, a paper from uh, Selangor in Malaysia. Uh, so 125 species, they uh, listed the used mangroves. 43 were exclusive. Um, and uh, 47 were associated with the use of mangroves as for roost and nesting. Um, about four out of six of the resident specialists uh, occur in more than two sites. So we're looking into how um, persistent a particular species in between their study sites. So I think I kind of followed that in a sense when we looked into our paper and how we could uh, categorize certain species as um, uh, obligate facultative. Also again, importance of nectivores. So for our study, we uh, conducted our study um, on extensive, amazing mangrove swamps and coastal forests of Sogdav. So mangroves as far as your eye can see. And of course, it's one of the most recognized in the Philippines. Uh, it belongs to what we call the Shargo Islands Protected Landscape and Seascape. And of course, the area that's most predominant uh, in the in Shargao is the mangroves of the Carmen. Then it's part of a comprehensive study uh, that was led by uh, University of, of Santo Tomas. Uh, Mamsel, of course, is the one leading us. And there's different partners. I'll show you that they're the, the group, the partners at the end. Oh. And of course, uh, funded by uh, uh, NRC PBOSD. So it was a, a way to assess the biodiversity of uh, the mangroves of Shargao. And in a way, try to determine its relevance to protection, especially through uh, the Ramsar Convention. And here's an example of a, a, um, um, a document that helps look into the criteria of Ramsar and its potential uh, for Shargao to uh, be used in terms of uh, expanding the conservation importance of uh, Sargo mangroves. And of course, I'll be using the criteria designed for water birds. There's actually several criteria. What you want to and tends to be on habitat, but there's two criteria very specific on birds. That's criteria five and six. So the methods we use, of course, with the usual um, inventory for birds, we use transit counts uh, at, between uh, uh, 50 to 100 meters across a certain area and set. It was a little bit difficult because you, most of the areas were in water, so you had to use boats. 
to do the transit count. Um, and then there were areas which had a lot more um, um, dry land, so it was easier for them, for us to do and conduct mist netting stations. Um, so we've covered about 10, well, actually 11 sites, uh, most of which are mangroves, and of course some interspersing into coastal forest areas and some into um, more uh, built up areas. Ended of course in, in twice in August and in November, 2019, looking into the seasonality of uh, migratory species. So here's a, a map of, these are eight sites, um, not all 11, uh, we just added 11 after. Uh, so there's eight which are, tend to be more predominantly mango, some towards the seaward side and some of course towards the landward side. But again, we tried to intersperse into the main area of the mangroves. Again, this is plotted by, Floor had a really good way of plotting up our, our, uh, our expedition time and the timeline that we pushed through in terms of uh, the mangrove area. So yes, these are all, uh, so the land that you can see, uh, you know, pointer, no, you can actually see the outline of uh, the actual land area and which is actually um, shallow water where the mangroves are growing. So the areas that we went to are on several barangays across uh, Del Carmen, Jargao. So here's another one, the more specific view of all the different study sites. So this is a study site, uh, one in Katipunan, which is where actually the base camp is. Uh, and um, there's a lot more um, terrestrial areas, uh, more dry land. So we were allowed to put more mist nets in this area. So then you have Esperanza, also allowed to put uh, mist netting stations there, site five. Then site six was in Bituon. Um, there was a kind of an area that uh, goes around on the coastal side, but ends up into a pier. So it was a little bit difficult to go around um, further. So yeah, we kind of limited our areas in Bituon um, as well. It's more, um, had to use a lot more boats in uh, Kabugao uh, because it was an entry point between uh, the mainland towards the island of uh, San Fernando. So the same um, study sites, but of course where the, the habitats are. So the more compressed uh, mangroves in uh, Katipunan. So you see a lot of epiphytes as well. And here's the one with Esperanza showing an egret, and that is one of the um, estuaries leading out into the bay. And you have Bituon where there's a pier, and uh, Kabuga where there is also a pier leading out into San Fernando. So of the um, 10 study sites, we record about 99 species of birds. So it's comparable with the other studies that we saw early in the different papers. Um, not as big as Selangor, but of course, uh, comparable with that of Palawan. Uh, we plotted about uh, nearly 8,000 individuals, represent about 42 avian families and 15 orders. And you can see here, uh, this is a plot of the uh, uh, bird species diversity using the Shannon Weiner function. And you notice there's of course a sort of a bias uh, of two sites, San Fernando and Katipuna. Katipuna because it was more on the landward side, there's a lot of areas where there's interspersing with coastal forest. Um, so it does add into that connectivity though. So, so it's not just mangroves, but also coastal forest. Same thing with San Fernando, it's an island. So it's uh, had these fringing mangroves, but a lot of areas of course, were still a coastal forest on San Fernando, apart from the settlements in the middle. But in ways there is kind of a, a similarity across the different values for BSD. Um, so adding on to those 99 species, we found another 15 records that were done previously uh, by other surveys. So in, in Del Carmen, so we think there's about 114 species that actually occur uh, in the mangroves of Del Carmen. Uh, if you put into that bigger context of uh, the protected landscape, uh, seascape and landscape, you have about 204 species. So it's roughly half of the known species, or more than half of the known species uh, occurring within the protected landscape. 
And from overall uh, comparison, we think that we added about 10 additional uh, records of birds that was not recorded previously. But this was recorded. This is a uh, large billed crow or the wak, a very prominent species in mangroves and coastal forests, as well as settlements, and of course, uh, lowland forest. So the composition of the species that we recorded uh, includes a lot of waders, shorebirds, and waterfowl, about 22 species of that. Uh, we look into residency, uh, which species are uh, migratory, even though we did a lot of work during the seasonal migration, we only got about 16 species. It's still quite interesting that mangroves, uh, they have a lot of endemism. So it's 24 species, which we are recognized as uh, Philippine endemics, including a few um, greater Mindanao endemics. And surprisingly, it is a home to five threatened species. So this is a photo of a, um, a gray streak flycatcher, a, which is a migratory species, very prominent in the mangroves in Shergao. So here's a, just a set of uh, pictures to show you um, from the uh, intermediate egret to the, um, the black-winged stilt, uh, some plovers, and of course, the little egret, which is quite common across uh, the different areas of mangroves, especially on uh, shallow mudflats. Most of the species are migratory, have a lot of sandpipers. This is a great uh, greetle tattler, a common sandpiper, the brown shrike, and again, the gray street flycatcher. So giving you two sets of migratory species, both on uh, the water side or the, uh, the seaward side and on the landward side. For resident species, so there are resident breeders, uh, none of them are migratory. So you have uh, the uh, green imperial pigeon or the balud, have several uh, the bee eaters, uh, the blue tail bee here shown here, um, or the pirik pirik. And then you have some of the herons, such as the little mangrove heron, also known as the striated heron, and a beautiful a pied triller. Um, often uh, heard around the mangroves laughing. It has a very distinctive laughing call. Aside from the residue, you also have the endemic species. So here you have uh, four, well, one is near endemic, which is the black chin fruit dove on the right. Um, then you have the, um, the short billed um, uh, subspecies of the white eared brown dove, um, which is a greater Mindanao endemic, but of course, uh, the yung split taxonomically, so we're still calling it white eared brown dove. And it's still Fapitreron uh, Ducotis uh, Brevirostris. And then you have the Philippine Pied Fantail or the Marecapra, and of course a very beautiful, sad to say uh, the, the, the specimen we caught was a young, uh, well, it's a young adult that was still molting, so hindi magandai pa ka. I don't know, feathers, so you have here the yellowish bulbul, which is a greater Mindanao endemic. So I think from this study, we were able to understand um, the importance of mangroves, particularly with the associated uh, association of of birds in sort of at interplay in functional diversity. We have uh, functional linkages that allow maintenance of biodiversity. So within those, um, so kind of narrowed it down to eight sites, most of which were strictly mangrove and coastal forest. Um, took away some of the other ones with the settlement. So um, 43 species um, we think are more associated towards coastal forests and mangroves. Most of them were non-endemic residents, but of course, uh, shared uh, outside the Philippines and Southeast Asia, South Asia and Australasia. And some were very widespread endemics found throughout the Philippines, but still Philippine endemics and a few greater Mindanao endemics. So just to look into how we kind of identify the specificity of a particular, how you differentiate, you obligate from that of facultative. Uh, we simply just took a list and jot down all the different uh, core mangrove areas um, and see which one's actually more predominant. So it's just a matter of presence and absence across the different mangrove sites. So those eight, of course, we grouped them as group A on all sites, they were there. Um, also, we looked into abundance as well, but for the simpler uh, um, table, we'll just look into presence and absence. Group B is, uh, is about seven out of eight. Group C, six out of eight sites. Uh, D, uh, more or less, 
doesn't actually pick just because it's just found in three sites or four sites out of the total, but we also think they represent species kind of like inhabit mangroves that just a little difficult to probably identify in the field. So maybe they may be there, but it will just not easier to record them. So we put them as group B. So here's examples of what group A, B, and C, and D are. So the black nape oriole is group A because it's recorded on all eight sites. Um, very bit of it. Also, it's quite easy to identify because of their distinctive <laughs> call. Um, also very uh, flashy, bright yellow color. So it's easy to, to, to cite in the field. Um, another one is the, uh, the, the yellow belly uh, gerigon or fly eater. It's, a, it's actually basically as a mangrove specialist, but it's not easy to record as well. So you didn't get it at all sites. It was seven out of eight sites. So maybe some you can be on the site. Six out of eight, you have the uh, white breasted wood swallow or the git git. Um, again, they're, they're easy to spot because they're very territorial. So you see them flying around on the top of canopies. Um, then you have D, which is. Uh, they're not usually recorded again, that's just less than, than five sites or so three to four sites, which is the pink, the beautiful pink neck green pigeon, um, often associated with coastal forest. Um, but again, we think it's it should be in a particular group that we didn't list for all eight, but a very distinctive uh, mangrove associate. Just a simple test is just looking into the similarity of the different sites. So we use the index of similarity, which is basically A. Uh, we just tick, say, one um, to bang. Um, it's, it's always the uh, comparison of two sites. So that's why it's plotted there on a uh, uh, on the box. You have, um, say, site A versus site B, the number of species. And what are the species that are common between them? That becomes. C, so it's A plus B over 2C, and just get the index for similarity. Of course, different index have different measures. Um, looking into the breaker test, we had about a value between 40 to 50. Actually, it's the same values up there, just add times 100. Uh, similarity was about 40 to 60% across the different mangrove sites. So we can half are eat the same species across all eight sites. And we kind of narrow it down for two groups from group A to group B, which kind of ended up with 23 species, which I think are uh, distinctly occurring or more associated to mangroves because they're found across at least five out of the eight sites. So it was a, a bit more than the one recorded in the other papers where they said like two or more. So I'm a conservative, but at least for us, we're more specific with five out of eight sites. And here we can recognize them as what we call core mangrove associates. So all of the ones here you see on the table, uh, which has the darkened areas, represent those core mangrove associates, especially with species. Uh, because you can read that Aplonis paniensis or the Asian glossy sarding, I think in Shergo de call it E, um, Galanxiang, uh, those blackbirds with the red eyes. Um, so they're all found throughout uh, the eight sites as opposed to the wood swallow is only found in six out of the eight sites. So here again, it's examples of those 23. I'm not gonna go through all 23, but here's some examples. Uh, just to point out on the upper right, or my upper left, we have the Aldeback sunbird. Um, originally, it was described as a subspecies unique to the area uh, called uh, Dinicatensis, but was of course placed under synony, synon, synonym synonymy uh, with uh, the jugularis. Uh, it's quite unique because most jugularis uh, across uh, Eastern Philippines has a yellow breast. The ones in Shargao and Dinangat has kind of an orange wash on the upper breast as you can clearly see here. And that is actually distinctive as a subspecies in Palawan, which is the nearest jugularis aurorae. So she had an orange breast. Um, so it's something I would think when we got actually a, uh, we caught this in the mist net and Mulami was clearly nakita in orange color. Mm, I think there's something that has to be done in terms of its uh, taxonomy, either to resurrect the old subspecies um, or probably look, look into that differentiation. Because if aurorae is a distinct subspecies and this is not, so 
something has to be done to, to look into its taxonomy further. Of course, there's the Galanchang or the Asian glossy starling, very distinctive black bird with red eyes. Um, on your lower left, we have a female mangrove fly, blue fly catcher. Again, being a mangrove associate, it's named after mangroves, so mangrove blue, but it actually wasn't recorded on all eight sites. It's actually group G because it wasn't actually, uh, sorry, mean nakalagay pa ng A sa gitna, that should be there. Um, then you have here with the, uh, oh, no, sorry, I'm just gonna go back. Ah, sorry, my bad. Yes, it is reported on all sides, sorry. Um, so it is a, a mangrove search across eight sites. Um, then you have the collared kingfisher. Again, very distinct, the big carol uh, found throughout. It's also very easy to, to, to observe because of their distinctive call. A little hard to, to copy that. Gap group B, which is the uh, Pacific swallow. And then you have uh, on the bottom, you have the, um, the yellow wattle bulbul, which is a Philippine endemic. On the upper right, you have the Rubini kite or the lawing. And then on uh, the lower right, you have the coleto. So the coleto is actually a forest species, but they do occur in mangroves as well. So it's, um, they, it's a little hard to say they're mangrove um, obligate, they could be mangrove fa faculty, uh, for faculty. So uh, they're not, they had the option to go into mangroves, but not distinctly restricted to mangroves. So now going to the, um, the discussion wherein we have, we looked into the five criteria um, proposed by Ramsar. So there are actually two criteria which are more distinctive for birds, so that, that the, our data would be able to provide. Um, criterion five was on wetlands should be considered internationally important if it regularly supports 20,000 or more in population or uh, individuals of water birds. So in our study, um, our count being only done in twice uh, a, uh, in a year and at a particular time period uh, was not able to do a very definitive census of the water of the water birds, especially the, the shorebirds that move around because um, it was hard to time the tide using boats and then arriving at an area to do the count and then waiting again for the tide. So it, it was logistically a little difficult to do a proper census count. Um, might be done again to further um, probably planning in terms of the tide and what areas actually are uh, there are, uh, most of the, mig uh, the migratory shorebirds are found. But we were able to do some counts of interesting groups of shorebirds that were uh, pre-roosting. So we didn't do enough counts for a particular species. So collective themes, it was in the thousands, but not necessarily um, 8,000 birds in the, uh, reported, but not necessarily in that magnitude of 20,000. So again, further study needs to be done. Um, but it is an important refuge for about 22 species of water birds, which I think is uh, uh, something to be put into that criteria, especially with waders and shorebirds, such as this wimbrel. There's lots of wimbrel pre-roosting. So they're coming up from different sides of uh, the, the mangrove area towards the mangrove, um, often from other parts of the island, and then coming into the mangrove to pre-roost. So actually it was done on the observation tower. So that's a very good, very useful observation tower. So we're able to uh, view the birds coming in as they pre-roost. And of course, out of those uh, water birds includes about 16 migratory species. So it is in terms of say the convention of migratory species, an important area for 16 species that we share across uh, other countries, these migrant birds, including the Wimbrel. So here's a view of from the, the, the observation tower. So as you see, there are flocks of wimbrels on the upper, on the upper two photos. A close up of those photos actually help identify. We we're actually thinking there were a mixed species uh, because there were some which didn't look very distinctively like wimbrels. Uh, so we just put them as numinous sp because we think it might be bristle thigh or it might be 
all the other threatened species of, uh, of curlews that are found in the Philippines. Uh, but again, we'll, that needs further uh, confirmation. So a lot of them in Wimbo, some a few species were, a few individuals were not, were probably other species of curlews. Uh, what's interesting about um, Wimbrels and flight, you can actually see the white patch on the back, which is very distinctive across the different curlers found in the Philippines. So yes, that it is, is, is a way to kind of identify them in, uh, during that uh, fast flight across the mangroves. And on the lower pictures, you have a massive flocks, hundreds of uh, pied imperial pigeons or what we call camaso. Um, so they're large pigeons, very distinctive color, black and white, also it's sometimes called the nutmeg imperial pigeon. And they were all coming in from other sides of the island towards the mangroves to pre-roost. So just shows you how important the mangroves are as a roosting area for, uh, for birds, not just with the migratory species, but also the resident fugivores, such as the pied imperial pigeon. Criterion six um, looks into a wetland, should be considered uh, globally important if it regularly supports 1% of the individuals in a population of a particular species or subspecies of a water bird. So we looked into all the different water birds that we actually uh, recorded. Um, at the mangroves level, so just the eight sites, it was difficult to put into context of the population because it's a small, it's a small subset of the population. Um, but yes, we did record one species, subspecies that was unique to Dinagat and uh, Shargao, and that is Alcacid's brown tit babbler. So it's not a water bird, but it is a species, a forest bird, which occurs in lowland forest up to mangroves. So it's a subspecies of the brown tit babbler, uh, named after Gutafedo Alcacid. So that's subspecies unique only to the islands. Um, and that, of course, represents we have to put out the, 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 if you map out the distribution or occupancy of that species, it comes about 34% of the population is in Shagao. But again, it's not a water bird. So still have to look to another species. So we looked into all the different shorebirds. Um, there were sufficient numbers of um, tattlers. Tattlers are very common, uh, common uh, sandpipers, quite common on all sides, but because they were solitary, mostly or in just pairs, though they don't actually amount to a very large subset and also because they're widespread across Southeast Asia and, and South Asia. So they have a wider um, kind of uh, coverage in terms of population. Of course, uh, most of them have quite stable populations. So none of them actually uh, reached up to 1% in those Cape or mangroves. So then we looked into one species of course, which was a threatened species, first thing you look into, kind of represents a smaller population, um, was the two waterfowl. So it's a wandering whistling duck, uh, uh, very distinctly easy to observe, but it flies through, because one of those, um, if you spot the species, you can hear them flying, of course, they're also quite feist flying. And then you have the Philippine duck, which was a bit more cryptic, so they usually hide in between the lagoons of the mangroves. Um, so probably we undercounted them at some ways, uh, but because there are data outside of Shargao mangroves, so we be able to use that to, to kind of put together the count around uh, Shargao Island. So we now consider not just the mangroves, but the entire um, protected land sea or Ziplas. So we counted out, I think there are about 100 to 120 uh, individuals uh, uh, within that uh, uh, protected landscape. And that comprises about 1.6% of the total global population. It being a Philippine endemic and restricted on the Philippines, also being threatened. So it's a smaller you know, population, but a wider uh, uh, set of uh, occupancy across the Philippines. So yeah, it does follow that criteria, criterion six. So really, that would be a useful uh, account of uh, a wetland species in Shargao. And to help um, monitor the species across uh, the different eight sites in uh, of mangroves in Chargoy and in Del Carmen, we put up um, a three-page um, 
sort of field guide from all the pictures we've gotten. Uh, also added in one or two few pictures that, uh, of species that we think are important, but we weren't able to get a good photograph of. So here they are. So we'll make this available too through, uh, and I'll probably ask permission first from um, uh, Cell if we could then, of course we can send this to you anytime. We'll just have to uh, put up certain sort of a downloadable area for this. But again, you can, if you need a copy, uh, we can send you a copy of this uh, photo. So it's all in PDF. And with that, uh, I am uh, uh, thankful for all the people who are involved, uh, especially uh, Mayor Coro and Vice Mayor Coro for uh, the opportunity for us to do, to come to Shargao and uh, uh, do that study. Uh, of course, to UST, for leading that project with NRCP, um, and of course NRCP for funding the project and all our different partners from us in the team at Langam, uh, Rolly Uriza, Flor Cruz, Edison Cosico, and Abby De Leola. Of course, there are, are different partners from uh, SIWCFI who helped us with the, uh, the survey work, from CCAT, um, and then of course the um, municipality of Del Carmen, thank you very much. Our different team members within the, the survey group from the National Museum, from NFRDI, and, uh, and of course from DOSD. Uh, with that, again, thank you very much. Floor, questions? Right, thank you very much, sir. It's really easy for that uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, we'll start the just stop sharing. Uh, all right, okay. So we'll start the, the open forum. Uh, I'll kick the ball rolling. Uh, so if you would compare uh, the mangrove forest of Del Carmen uh, with other wetlands, so how would you characterize C plus uh, comparing it to you know the other wetlands like uh, there in Pampanga, Bataan, Cagayan, Tawi-Tawi. So, yeah, just your opinion. Thank you, Flor. So, uh, yeah, because we did that work in uh, Florida, went to um, one of the Ramsar sites in the north, which is, interestingly, we call it Santa Teresita, Santa Teresita Cagayan. So we did also a bird survey there. Um, it's actually more known as Bugay Wetlands because Santa Teresita used to be part of Bugay. So it's a separate municipality now. So uh, there's still uh, some of the sites that are uh, of the wetlands are still in Santa Teresita. Again, they have these important, um, not just uh, natural wetlands, but also uh, man-made wetlands, which are rice fields, which intersperse into uh, small ponds and lakes and towards the coast. So quite useful in terms of uh, being a staging area for migratory species because it is in the north northmost tip of the island of Luzon Island. So when migratory birds come down from uh, from the north, from through Taiwan, and then Batanes, and then come down to Luzon. So they're again an important staging area. And then you have nearby Bugay. So uh, it's all quite wide wetlands of reeds and marsh. Uh, so it is suited more for shorebirds. There's a lot of species of shorebirds there. So you know difference now with uh, Shargao because it's less of the mud flats that are exposed, more of the covered with the mangroves. So I think that's why the you would we had difficulty counting shorebirds uh, because there are less exposed mud flats for them to feed on. But they are important as roosting sites. So Butiniana, we had that opportunity to see the wimbrels coming into flocks and of course the egrets as well. There's numerous flocks of egrets uh, during the pre-roosting time. So uh, and they are important as foraging areas, but because it was inaccessible, the mga areas na may exposed mud flats. Because most of the time we were moving on boat, so masyadong malalim for for them to to be foraging areas for water birds, for shorebirds. Yeah. So yeah, that's one example. So go to Tawi Tawi. Uh, we weren't able to go that much to a lot of the mangrove areas, but again, they're mostly fringing as well on the sides. Ito talaga maganda is. Uh, because it's a large shallow area uh, of the bay that's covered with mangroves. So talagang kita mo continuous. Uh, it's like almost a sea of mangroves if you're yeah. viewing it from San Fernando on the peak of the hill. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's kind of like, um, 
di ba yung mga nakikita mo sa pag nanonood ka ng mga uh, David Attenborough documentaries they have these uh, massive areas of habitat. Uh, But of course, sir, it presents a no. Uh, it presents a bigger scale of uh, difficulty in terms of uh, surveying, because um, may inherent difficulty pagdating sa logistics and you know boats, the tides. Hindi tulad po ng like yung mud flats, right, sir? No. Yes, and even worse because there's even it's only one set of kind of imagine hindi siya kasi multi-layered eh. Although there are areas na merong mas old growth siguro na mangroves that are multi-layered. So, katulad sa Katipuna, mas maraming punong matataas. So that's why there's more species that were recorded because there's greater kind of may, may mas difference, may mas available niches kasi two-tiered na yung canopy. As opposed to the one in the middle na kados, isang set parang puro ay the Rhizopora Vizinia paulit-ulit yung mangroves na species. So, tapos tight lead knit pa sila. So it's actually difficult to observe birds unless they're on top of the of the, the canopy or outside into the roots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, logistically it's difficult. Okay, uh, may I call on King Roy the Tyrone Ombrosa? To, uh, he is a UPLB MS and Vice High student. Can you throw in your question, uh, King Roy? Hi, Pa. Hello. Um, I'm from Agus- I'm from Agusan del Sur, which is a location of a Ramsar site, which is Agusan Marsh. Compared to other countries, we only have seven of these Ramsar sites, if I'm not mistaken. Other than the water bird criteria, is it that hard to consider a wetland to be a Ramsar site? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, no, there's a lot of different criteria. Actually, I just pointed out the two ones because it's mas specific siya for birds. Talaga na kada gaydo na criteria five and six is for birds, water birds. So of course, are the other one criteria. Criterion one is about habitat. Uh, criterion two is whether they is this is a sanctuary for threatened species. I think so. So maybe but talaga ng criteria more suited. So others are more physiochemical ang approach or or vegetation ang approach. So yes, it 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 hindi naman necessarily just for water birds. Of course, we need to think about Ramsar. Ang talagang flagship species in our uh, taxa would be the, the wetland birds. So usually, yung ginagamit na, na na basis. But it extends further in terms of other species. Kaya flora and fauna yung survey. Uh, it covers not just bird, but also all different aspects of organisms occurring in wetlands, such as the shargo mangroves. So yeah, I think Agusan, um, it's... An important area for sure, but also again because yeah, so I think it's a similar component. Na parang pagwasa is always flooded, yung marsh. So even though it's an, a marsh, na ay nandam si gurong shorebirds. Yeah, it's not as as easy to spot shorebirds in a gusan marsh, but more uh, there's a lot of waders. Siguro yung mga tikling, yung mga moorhen, and some species which are uh, otherwise a bit more water rather than exposed mudflats. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think crocodiles were, I think, the most important aspect kaya nas- nasama siya sa, na approve siya sa Ramsar. Any more questions from the audience? Sir, no. meron ho bang, did you find any, like, observation or to the relationship of birds, the presence of birds or the species of the birds uh, on the species of mangroves? Ye- meron bang... Have you found uh, something on an observation? Thank you. Yes. So, not necessarily about the species of mangroves, but we're all looking more about the kind, the habitat itself. So, it, ang maganda sa study nato is you have an opportunity to look into uh, studying organisms that uh, are associated or, or live in mangroves or inhabit mangroves because your sites are or mangroves. In your purpose and survey, di ba? Di naman tayo nag mm-hmm tayo nagpunta ng lowland for hindi katulad ng usual expeditions na you always have that uh, multi-habitat um, study so this is more specific for mangroves so and because it's a very large area with mangroves so you have that opportunity to go to multiple sites and compare uh, the composition of the species that you get problem is we didn't have the data at the time for for um, the plants as well at saka hindi pare-pareho yung um, distinctively the 
the uh, hindi natin ma-match up yung data at the, the time we were for doing the report so i think now we'll got probably go back in and look into the data and then see how it compares in terms of plant species diversity and bird species diversity that is yeah thank you sir uh former mayor alfredo coro who is now the vice mayor uh would like to give a feedback sir kurs are you there Hello, sir. Uh, thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Uh, Dr. JC, just want to express the, on behalf of the municipality of Del Carmen and uh, Mayor Baby Coro of the municipality of Del Carmen, our um, gratitude and, and thanks to the team and uh, for um, doing this very critical um, study for us to really pursue the Ramsar listing. Um, this particular study is also uh, a pilot for the NRCP of how we could uh, utilize um, experts in the field, um, especially uh, in the area of environmental uh, management and protection so that we would be able to maximize the assets of the Philippine diversity. And I think that that's why we got the initial approval to have this study because we really wanted to do a pilot that can be replicated and scaled on a national capacity for us to be able to understand further what is it that makes uh, the Philippine um, ecosystem very unique from the rest of the world and hoping that um, the results can be utilized in different uh, sectors such as tourism, um, research, for medicines, uh, for other um, um, usage, uh, livelihood, uh, especially in, in terms of the current uh, pandemic recovery strategy, uh, we are very uh, dependent on the science of how we could move forward. So the results of this study has been very encouraging. And again, um, we are very grateful that, that uh, the team went through um, this particular study and agreed to do this with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Coro. Uh, also, uh, very thankful for the opportunity and of course for uh, inviting us to do the study in, in Shargao. It's a, an amazing place and we're very lucky to have uh, this amazing biodiversity as well. Um, and hornbills in your backyard. <laughs> so thank you very much, Dimpo. Any more questions from the, from the audience? Okay. May I call on... Oh, first of all, uh, Mayor, current Mayor... Uh, Professor Fina Coro is uh, uh, saying that uh, she wants to thank the NRCP team and uh, she's uh, grateful and thank you. Thank you. Thanks to DOSD SEC Roy de la Pena for the support providing funds to the research and study. And thank you, ma'am, for hosting the UPLB MNH and the uh, NRCP team uh, during the field works. May I call on Patrick Hernandez uh, from CLSU? Patrick, can you throw in your question? Um, <clears throat> um, hello, po. good morning. Um, curious lang po ako if are there any visible threats po ba sa mga birds na present sa Siargao Island or could um, meron po bang arising problems na nakikita dito sa Siargao na magiging threat sa mga birds, especially sa Siargao na kailangan ma-address po. Yun lang po, thank you. Okay, so uh, um, one of the uh, things that we often discuss about mangrove species, uh, mangrove birds, is the presence of foraging area. So um, if you, um, I think in case ng Shargao mangroves, because they have a very thick uh, growth of mangroves, bihira talaga yung exposure ng mudflats. Um, so if we expect to have more shorebirds, then I guess we have to limit the amount of siguro coverage and, and leave siguro nature to, to um, naturally extend the mangrove area. So it's actually a very, very wide area covered with mangroves. So meron ngayon interplay. It's actually just start, going to start like in discussions about five years ago between um, bird ecologists and mangrove, uh, mangrove mangroves but they're mostly uh, into mangrove expansion so yung man-made 
So there's always that point na not all areas of coastal areas are suited for uh, mangroves. So minsan hindi talaga tutubo kasi iba yung substrate. So may natural din substrate pa kailangan ng mangroves. There's also a point where you don't have to expand it further because yes, it's good that you have a large coverage, but you also lose out. Yung meron siyang trade-off. That's I think that's the right word for it. May trade-off. So if you want more forest, that's fine. You get a lot more forest dwelling species. So you gain the species which tend to be uh, more terrestrial, but you lose the species which tend to be more uh, on the water side, like shorebirds and waders. So some of the bird ecologists na pro-waders, we want more shorebirds, said, oh, wag na kayo magtanim. Kasi pag marami na, it's enough that you have, then wag na taniman. So I don't think it's a threat. It's more of union trade-off, siguro, for natural areas. But of course, there's the, the usual threats are there for all every uh, protected area and ecosystem from, um, of course, uh, it's more of the regulation and the implementation. The usual, you know, hunting and cutting. But uh, for us, we were lucky because um, we were all in these very prime areas. Thank you, sir. Uh, any more questions from the participants from the audience? Going once, going twice. Wala na po ba? Okay. I think... Uh, Just wait for a few. Okay. Uh, they're saying thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sir JC. Okay. Uh, probably we'll be ending our uh, the talk. Uh, thank you, Sir JC, for that uh, interesting presentation. And of course, your um, expert uh, opinion and uh, answers uh, for our questions uh, given by the, by the audience. So usually during the seminar, Sir JC will be awarding the certificate. So me being the coordinator for extension, I will be doing uh, this honor. So first, let me share my share my screen. Okay. Okay. I hope you. I hope you. Kita you, sir. Okay. Evaluation form. <laughs> All right. Okay. So with that, uh, we would like to uh, award this certificate of recognition to our director, Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez, for serving as the resource person uh, today for the biodiversity seminar on mangrove associated birds of Chargao Island held on uh, today, uh, February 10, uh, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Uh, Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. And in witness whereof, my signature is uh, fixed as being as being as the coordinator for extension. So with that, thank you very much, sir, uh, for being a resource person for today's seminar. Okay. Virtual palakpakan na lang tayo. Oh, so like, hey. oh, yes, sir. yung unshare. I'm sorry. Babasahin lang sa Oh, I see. Okay, wait lang, sir. Wait lang, sir, huh? Or share. Stop share. Okay, sir. Okay naman. Hindi ko din mahanap yung aking ano kanila point. But yeah, again, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I'd like to, again, thank the uh, LGU of Siargao, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor Coro, of course, to NRCP for the opportunity to, to do the project with, of course, our team leader and... Uh, uh, from the University of Santo Tomas, si Ma'am Selva Nagmoran. Um, Abby, also, thank you, siya po yung aming facilitator. And all our, actually, the birds are just, tawag namin team langgam, but actually we're just a, a one part of a very big group. This is one of the, I think, uh, comprehensive studies. So it's, a, it's, it's an amazing way to look into biodiversity. So if we think about protection of uh, Sharga mangroves to consider for Ramsa, it's not just the bird data. It's an amazing collection of data from arthropods to plants to amphib to herpetofauna, mammalian fauna, and fish fauna, of course, and of course even to crustaceans and corals. So it's it's a very wide girth of data that 
hopefully will be useful to all the stakeholders. Again, we I, I took the opportunity to not only kasi nimbita ako ni Flor maggawa ng BSS kasi dahil kasama magkasama kami dun sa sa team um uh, I missed the doing the presentation during the the stakeholders meeting and of course Rolly was there to 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 fill it in but again um, it's, a, it's it's another way to to present uh, how amazing the biodiversity is of short mangroves and again we hope it would be um uh, towards that uh you know it's a, already a project there but towards another level of being recognized as an in globally important wetland so can thank you Bob. thank you very much sir so uh before we end this meeting uh, i'm reminding everyone to please click on the link that i have posted on the chat box it's it goes to the evaluation form so when you fill up the evaluation form you will receive uh, a digital uh, e-certificate uh, within the day. Uh, if not, you could go to this link, bit.ly uh, bit slash 2021 slash uh, dash BSS dash eval. So we will be accepting responses only until 5 p.m. Uh, you could go to our website, which is mnh.uplb.edu.ph if you want to learn more about the Museum of Natural History. If you want to contact us, uh, you could drop an email at mnh.uplb.edu.ph. We are in Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. So just look for the account UPLB Museum. And um, we are also in Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. So reminder that the recording will be uploaded to YouTube, uh, hopefully by tonight or tomorrow morning. So if ever that uh, there, at your end may technical problem, hindi nyo na panood lahat, uh, we invite you to go to our YouTube channel, subscribe and hit that notification bell so that for future uploads, you will be notified that uh, we have uh, uploaded the, our new seminars. So with that, uh, maraming salamat po. And uh, we hope that you could join us again tomorrow, 10 a.m. We will have another webinar. It's a very interesting topic about the ants and the bacteria that they are associated with. And um, I'm, we are happy to... Uh, uh, host you once again tomorrow. So with that, uh, maraming salamat po. Uh, keep safe. 